Whatever happened to 2D Zelda? In this video, we're going to look at the last 15 years and find out where the key figures behind the games have ended up. We're going to look at how 2D Zelda in particular is caught between two radically different philosophies of game development at the heart of Nintendo. And ultimately, we're going to look to the future to see where 2D Zelda heads next, when we might expect it and who might be involved. This is a Nintendo Forecast Deep Dive. It's been a long time since the 2D Zelda games were regularly developed at Nintendo. Grezzo produced 2019's Excellent Link's Awakening, but it was still ultimately a remake. 2015's Triforce Heroes was original, but multiplayer focused, and 2013's A Link Between Worlds heavily utilised the A Link to the Past map. Before that, you have to go back to 2009's Spirit Tracks to find the last time 2D games were regularly made. But I don't think Nintendo has abandoned the concept of 2D Zelda any more than the long hiatus after new Super Mario Bros. U indicated that they had abandoned 2D Mario. Mario came roaring back with Super Mario Bros. Wonder, and I think there's every chance for Zelda's next title to be the same. A radical and comprehensive rethink of what this world is in the 2D space. However, to understand what that might look like and what the considerations could be at Nintendo's development headquarters EPD, we need to see how Nintendo views 2D games, and particularly 2D Zelda. For a long time, top-down Zelda was simply the handheld version of Zelda, the version of Zelda that the relatively underpowered handhelds could cope with. Since N64, 3D games were the preserve of the home console, and 2D titles stuck to handhelds and never would they cross over, well, except briefly for Four Swords Adventure on GameCube. This held true until 2009's Spirit Tracks, but with the arrival of the 3DS, everything changed. For the first time, a system was capable of running good quality 3D titles, and suddenly 2D titles were no longer mandated by tech requirements, but just one of the options for developers. It should be said that the Super Mario Bros. titles had a very different approach. For better or worse, there is an incredible level of consistency between the console and handheld games, and even Super Mario Run. Ideas are ideas, after all. But for the Zelda team, different considerations began to take root. 2013's A Link Between Worlds was not just a new 2D game, but a chance to prototype a new concept. Dungeons that could be tackled in any order. With its largely reused world map and experimental approach, this was the first time that 2D Zelda felt like it was serving up not just a fantastic game in its own right, but also, in many ways, a prototype for a new type of play before they went full tilt into the development of a vastly more expansive and expensive game, Breath of the Wild. Indeed, you could say that reusing a past world map but building a new game on top of it made it a proof of concept just as much for Tears of the Kingdom. And as part of the development of Breath of the Wild, they went even further down the route of using 2D Zelda as a prototype, creating a full version of their chemistry engine in the style of the original 1986 Legend of Zelda title. Triforce Heroes reused Zelda's game engine, but again it felt like it was trying something new, specifically multiplayer mechanics. A. Jiao Numa discussed his interest in multiplayer Zelda with IGN in 2016, saying, I would like to take what I learned from Breath of the Wild and see if we can somehow fuse those learning points into another multiplayer Zelda. For example, with Triforce Heroes, which followed a similar format of Four Swords, there was multiplayer involved in that game. That's definitely a possibility and we will continue to experiment throughout the Zelda franchise, but for whatever reason, these deliberations have yet to bear fruit, so perhaps the more muted response to Triforce Heroes prompted them to reconsider. Link's Awakening was a remake, but still had one very experimental feature, a dungeon builder. After the outsized success of Super Mario Maker on Wii U, many people had demanded a Zelda Maker, and so this was the chance for the Zelda team to prototype what that might look like by adding it in as an extra mode to an existing title. It's not that Nintendo weren't proud of these titles in their own right, but nevertheless, the suspicion lingers that these titles wouldn't have been put into development in the first place, if the games didn't offer Anuma's team a chance to try something new. The picture we're building here is that 2D Zelda for a very long time has become kind of a testbed for Nintendo. And while it's beneficial if it can create a finished product, it is no longer essential as long as it supports the development of the larger games. One other comment that Anuma-san made on Link's Awakening is very telling. I think modern players are incredibly busy every day, and so the time they have to play games is more limited than it used to be. Frequent interruptions can often mean losing losing sight of the goals you're working towards in the game. I think he's right and that it's a central adaptation for games to keep people playing. However, while reducing the friction points to get people to start playing and to continue playing to the end is a priority for Nintendo, different studios have different approaches to it. Of course, everything Zelda goes through AGR Numa and Nintendo's EPD Production Group 3. But let's take a moment to look at how things can be different. Let's look at the production groups dealing with Super Mario. 
Yes, I say groups plural. The 2D and 3D Mario teams are not just separate teams, but they are clear across the country from each other. With the 3D team having moved to Tokyo in 2003, they both work on Mario, but they have different leaders, different directors, and to a large degree, they have been separate from each other. Now, there was a bit more cross-pollination of the groups recently, with Super Mario Bros. Wonder gaining the wisdom of Super Mario 3D World director Koichi Hayashida. And there's another key 2D Mario figure who came from outside the core group, and that was Shiro Mori, mourn him in a second. But for all intents and purposes, the two groups function as independent entities. And why not? After all, the 3D and 2D Marios have very distinct traditions and styles, especially for those Mario games that embrace the sandbox approach like Sunshine and Odyssey. That's just not the case with Zelda games who come under the same production group. Now, there were still two distinct teams, and Eiji Numa certainly wanted them to have a distinct approach from each other. In a 2017 interview, when Game Informer suggested that the mainline Zeldas would benefit from absorbing the 2D team, Eiji Numa rebutted, saying that the 2D Zelda team would continue alongside the 3D Zelda group. He said, The dev pace is not really dependent on how many people are on a team so combining them would not necessarily expedite the development pace. The 3DS team and the Wii U team have different approaches to game development, so I don't necessarily want to combine them and have them think together, but rather have each think about what they can bring to Nintendo Switch from their own perspective. I think it's really interesting that he notes the different approaches between the 3DS and the Wii U team, and that's something that we're going to explore a lot more as the video goes on. But for now, let's just focus on where that team is now. If we look at the three most senior people on A Link Between Worlds, their career trajectory since very much tells the story of the disintegration of the 2D Zelda team. A Link Between Worlds and Triforce Heroes director Hiromasa Shikata seems to have parted ways with EPD3 during the restructuring of Nintendo's development teams in September 2015. He has since progressed to developing 1-2 Switch and its sequel in a more senior, producerial role. His number two, Shino Mori, has also had a remarkable career uptick, but not developing Zelda. After Triforce Heroes, he progressed to working on 2D Mario titles, starting with directing New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe and supporting on Super Mario Maker 2 before headlining the most important 2D Mario in well over a decade as the director of Super Mario Bros. Wonder. Finally, the third Musketeer, sub-director and planning lead Kentaro Tominaga stayed with EPD3 and was still developing Zelda games until recently. He even moved up to the role of director. What did he direct? Why, the expansion pass for Breath of the Wild. Yes, in this case, he was poached by the 3D part of the team, which now seems to have become completely dominant. Still, the rise through the ranks of someone with 2D Zelda experience might have been very good news, someone who could return to 2D Zelda and lead it forward into the future. But sadly, no. In this case, Tomonaga-san didn't just leave Zelda, he left Nintendo completely in 2022 to join Chinese developers Paper Games to work on Infinity Nikki, an open-world version of their mobile dress-up RPG. Yet another Japanese developer to go to a Chinese-run studio as Tencent and NetEase eat into the Japanese video game market. So basically, all the most senior directors of the 3DS games are now elsewhere. That's not to say that everyone has headed to the hills. Other key figures from the 2D era, such as director of the DS games and supervisor of the 3DS Zelda's Daiki Awamoto, have also been dragooned back into the fold of the 3D games, working on Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. But it does seem that people with recent 2D Zelda experience are very thin on the ground. For all intents and purposes, it seems that for a decade now there has been no discrete Zelda 2D team, with Link's Awakening handled pretty much exclusively by the external team at Grezzo, under the producership of Eiji Numa. Now, there is a decent chance that Grezzo will be working on another 2D Zelda. It is, after all, coming up on five years since Link's Awakening. Grezzo is a pretty talented company, and I'm sure if Nintendo can find a group from EPD to work with them, it will end up being an impressive title. But still, what a sad state of affairs if there isn't a body of people at Nintendo exclusively dedicated to 2D Zelda. Even in the case of the 2D Metroid games, you know that Yoshio Sakamoto is completely across every detail. And the same with Kensuke Tanabe and his stable of games, for better or worse if you're a Paper Mario fan, I guess. It's also striking that Eiji Numa's recent comments do seem to cut against the very carefully cultivated experiences that most 2D games have been developing for most of the series' history. He told Game Informer last year, games where you need to follow a specific set of steps or complete tasks in a very set order are kind of the games of the past, whereas currently the games of today are ones in which 
that can adapt to players' own decisions and give them the freedom to flexibly proceed through the game, and the game will allow for that. Perhaps then it's little surprise that 2D Zelda has spent the last 15 years acting as a testbed for ideas for the mainline games when they arrive at all. Perhaps they're struggling to figure out how to translate 2D Zelda into this new gaming philosophy. But is there a shot for a 2D Zelda game that can bring a wholly different perspective to bear on the series? Different perhaps even from Eiji Aonuma. While Aonuma's freedom-focused philosophy is evidently well established within the Zelda team, there is another school of thought, and to find it, we only need to look at 2023's other major release alongside Tears of the Kingdom. I'm talking, of course, about Super Mario Bros. Wonder. You see, being so utterly vast, Tears of the Kingdom focused on what director Hidamaru Fujibashi called multiplicative gameplay elements, structures and mechanics that can appear throughout this vast open world, interact with each other, and create a huge number of possibilities as a result. There's really no other way to work on a game as big as the Wild Games. Can you imagine if every stable had an individualized event that needed to be hard-coded in? It would take them forever. The upshot is that while the game is utterly vast, a lot of the gameplay comes from the natural interchange between a few core mechanics and ideas, whether user control functionalities like Ultra Hand or functions of the chemistry mechanics that affect heat and cold. Because there are so many different ways to put these options together, it allows players incredible creativity and freedom. Multiplicative gameplay is a concept that made not just Zelda, but many of the great Nintendo franchises what they are. If you think about Pikmin or Fire Emblem or Splatoon, there are a few key functionalities that inform the vast majority of the gameplay. It's both a cost-effective and a hugely powerful way to make games. And yet, Super Mario Bros. Wonder ditched it. I mean, they didn't just ditch the concept, they catapulted it into the sun. With the theme of wonder in place, each level was designed to have a very specific and unique idea. A surprising idea each time, constantly trying to make the players laugh or gasp. The name Wonder was embodied throughout the experience. As Shinomori explained to the Nintendo website's developer interview section, when I think back to the first time I played the original Super Mario Bros. game, I remember feeling that it was full of hidden surprises and wonders. Coins would come out when you hit blocks and your body would grow bigger with super mushrooms. Back then, everything was new and packed with unexpected delights. However, now that the Super Mario games have been enjoyed by players for many years, those things have somehow become ordinary. That's why Tezuka-san's goal was to create moments that even modern players would find unexpected and wondrous. Koichi Hayashida added, 3D Mario games are sometimes described by the media and players as a toy box of ideas. So, I decided to apply some of these ideas we used to create 3D Mario games to a 2D Mario game. With these things in mind, we decided to have an idea-sharing session. Everyone from programmers to designers and sound designers joined in and wrote down gameplay ideas on sticky notes, which could be unrelated to their field of expertise, and we made prototypes on the spot. There were just so many ideas. Before this interview, I counted the number of sticky notes we had, and there were over 2,000. Of course, occasionally, even Super Mario Bros. Wonder repeats elements, especially during its very final run, but in general, every course in the game has a new surprise and these mechanics are crafted with no wider purpose in mind other than the individual level. And that's why, while Super Mario Bros. Wonder may not be a particularly long game, it's an incredibly dense and entertaining one, a more diametrically opposed approach to game development than the massive Tears of the Kingdom one could scarcely imagine. All of which brings us to the state of modern 2D Zelda. If there is a 2D Zelda team at all, it's an outsourced Grezzo team, and it's not immediately clear that any of the senior figures from the core games have either the inclination or even the interest to take time off to develop a smaller 2D title. But what if they decided to take the plunge and trade the multiplicative tiers approach for the wonder-based approach of Shiro Mori? Instead of using 2D games to prototype ideas for their main titles, they could exist as a collection of strange and wonderful oddities. Instead of shunning dungeon items, they could be embraced as ways to change things on their head in a way that nobody could expect, but also in a way that has no greater consequences for the game once the dungeon is done. Imagine what would happen if the Kyoto team gathered hundreds of posters for Zelda ideas and then tried to make a game that actually made the best ones a reality, irrespective of how time-consuming and complex it was. So how likely is this? Given how largely self-sufficient Grezzo has been in terms of developing his Zelda titles, it will be interesting to see how they deal with a fuller-fledged collaboration. Their Link's Awakening remake was super, but Triforce Heroes had an altogether more mixed response, and so if they were to be trusted with doing an original 2D Zelda, let alone the first original 2D Zelda after such a long time, one would hope they'd be partnered with a supervisor at Nintendo who understands Zelda 
but also understands how to spark that spirit of wonder. If only there were a senior director at the company who fit both boxes. Well, perhaps we've already met him. A link between world sub-director and programming lead turned Super Mario Bros. Wonder director Shiro Murray seems like the perfect person to literally serve as the link between the two worlds of gaming approaches. Having gained a wealth of experience in the Mario Kingdom, he would be the perfect person to come home to 2D Zelda and shepherd the franchise to new heights alongside the devs at Grezzo. Surely, when Eiji Onuma talked in 2016 about there being different philosophies between the 2D Zelda team and the 3 3D Zelda team, he must have had in mind particular people and particular discussions, and it wouldn't surprise me if Shiro Mori, based on his approach to Super Mario Bros. Wonder, is one of the people that he was thinking of. Still, it seems a stretch to believe that the Wonderkin director of Super Mario Bros. Wonder would leave after such a big hit. While, as we've seen, Nintendo's internal developers do move around, it's far more common once they reach a senior level for them to stay attached to a particular project or group for the long term. There is one slim hope from the existing stable of Zelda producers. Daiki Awamoto, director of the 2D titles, was credited as an assistant producer on Tears of the Kingdom. This sounds reasonably impressive, but his credit is sandwiched right above the special thanks credits which are usually reserved for people with a smaller impact on the game. Iwamoto-san now seems to be the senior figure under Eiji Onuma who has the broadest responsibility for Zelda, having supervised the expansion pass to Breath of the Wild and Age of Calamity, as well as being involved in producing Link's Awakening. He is also on the board of directors at Monolith Soft, which might come in useful if Monolith Soft move their Zelda team over to, for example, an Ocarina of Time remake. Whether someone spread so thin will be the right director for a new 2D Zelda title is not necessarily clear, and it's been 15 years since he directed a title. But I could definitely imagine Daiki Awamoto being the person Eiji Onuma would turn to in order to develop a team. And while the old 2D head honchos are now in the wind, that's not to say there aren't many people at Nintendo with Zelda experience and with none who might be interested in taking the director's chair for a reimagined 2D Zelda. Arisa Hosaka has been involved in planning a number of Zelda, Mario and Animal Crossing titles but hasn't had a credit since 2020. Yutaka Hiromuki is currently with EPT10 but has worked on planning and game design for Phantom Hourglass, Skyward Sword, Breath of the Wild as well as Splatoon 2 and the Octo expansion before becoming the planning director of the joyous Pikmin 4. With such a diverse range of experience, it would be really interesting to see his take on a top-down Zelda. Or, of course, like Shiromuri, there might be someone without previous Zelda experience that could bring a new perspective to the role. That said, even Mori-san took on the new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe port before heading his own title. This would suggest that if there were an EPD developer being groomed to take on the 2D role, you would expect to have found their credits in the Link's Awakening staff, and yet there is a conspicuous lack of non-Grezzo staff on that team. Tomoni Sato was there as one of the project coordination leads and has been an assistant director on some prior remakes, but generally, the senior people are all from Grezzo. Perhaps then it is the senior producers at Grezzo who will be leading 2D Zelda into the future. This certainly seems possible when you consider that Grezzo have not produced a new major game in nearly five years since the release of Link's Awakening. Yes, they did the Miitopia port and they've created their own titles, but we're still waiting to see a new Zelda game from them. And I think we can expect it given that they've worked on Zelda games consistently since 2011. I should just utter a word of caution here that it's not necessarily a big 2D title. I would love to see that, but there is another significant likelihood, and that is the revival of Ocarina of Time, a game that was rumoured last year, and the topic of which Eiji Onuma artfully dodged entirely when speaking to Game Informer with a quick no comment before pivoting to some light retrospection about the 1998 title. Unlike Link's Awakening, such a substantial remake would require considerable oversight, and I could easily see Kentaro Tomonaga supporting Grezzo in that endeavour. Frankly, from Nintendo's point of view, Ocarina of Time is far better poised as an early era game for the new console given its huge name recognition and enduring popularity, to say nothing of the fact that it has huge potential to be a graphical powerhouse. Grezzo themselves worked on Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask 3DS ports, so it would be very much a return to form. So unless Nintendo do have a 2D Zelda game as a surprise release for 2024, the central likelihood has to be that the new system will boast an Ocarina of Time remake early in its life cycle. So, does that mean that 2D Zelda is now not just top-down, but face-down? I don't think so. For one thing, Nintendo plays a long, long game. Super Mario Bros. Wonder would have been a major title at any point in the Switch's life, but they waited until it was six and a half years old to release it. 
even if Nintendo have other priorities with the Zelda franchise for the time being, that doesn't mean they don't have long-term aspirations for top-down games, a style of play that has been very good to them over the years and they know there is demand for, even if, in the short term, they may prefer to meet that demand through smaller-scale projects, the obvious low-hanging fruit being a remaster of A Link Between Worlds. Still, if Grezzo do get sidetracked by the remake of Ocarina of Time and potentially then a subsequent remake of Majora's Mask, it does prompt the question of whether or not there is another team that could work with EPD to develop 2D Zelda. If they can't find an internal team like the Wonder Team, could they find a partner in the same way that 2D Metroid was revived through the fantastic collaboration with Mercury Steam? If we're waiting for that, it could certainly be a long time before we see more 2D Zelda. But Nintendo is expanding, and so for that matter is Grezzo, and they've even published their own original titles as well, such as Ever Oasis on the 3DS and their recent Apple Arcade title Jet Dragon, for which they are still providing updates. However, publishing an original title doesn't necessarily mean that the team aren't still keeping their profitable and long-lasting partnership with Nintendo going, any more than Goodfield were unable to work on Princess Peach Showtime because of their original work on Monkey Barrels and Atogi Katsugeki Mameda no Bakaru Oracle Satoru no Sanan. I apologise for my pronunciation of that. In recent years, Grezzo has continued to grow and grow, expanding their teams and capabilities. In 2018, the company was 62 people strong, but by 2021, this had increased to 80 and it is still going up. They currently have this attractive banner advertising for graduates to join them in 2025. Now these numbers aren't vast by the standards of some video games developers and it's certainly true that the transition from primarily making 3DS titles to developing for Switch would have required a larger development staff, if only because Switch games are more graphically complex. Still, they're a third bigger than 2018 and with fewer larger games to show for it. Last year I made a video highlighting that they were hiring for cinematic artists, character control engineers and 3D CG map designers specifying that it's for an action game with tastes medieval and stylish. This appears to be Jet Dragon rather than a Zelda title, although to be honest, almost everything Grezzo puts out seems to have this kind of aesthetic. Still, the precedent of Goodfield suggests that if Grezzo are developing original titles, it's because the studio wants to expand in scope while Nintendo are continuing to commission projects of a similar size and scale. This may be because they want to secure other streams of revenue because Nintendo's projects are often very long term. Camelot is another example of a company that has a side business developing mobile infrastructure. It would be imprudent for any of these satellite companies at Nintendo to rely too much on Nintendo alone to continue to provide support and we saw from Alpha Dream and Vanpool that Nintendo is unsentimental about letting unprofitable long-time development partners go to the wall even if they've had a track record of producing great first-party games with them. Ultimately, a 4K remake of Ocarina of Time would be a massive graphical challenge and might require a lot of input from developers more experienced with high-end graphics. Link's Awakening couldn't even run on Switch without some level of stutter and there is absolutely no way that Nintendo will want the major Zelda title of their new console to have any kind of graphical issues whatsoever. Now, since Monolith Soft has a substantial team which supported in the graphical development of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, it would make sense for that team to take the heavy lifting graphically for an Ocarina of Time remake, perhaps even to take on the project wholesale. If this is the case, it would open the door for Grezzo to be working still on a new 2D game, just as Metroid Dread was in development hell for years, and just as Super Mario Bros. Wonder took a very long time to develop, there could be plans, long-term plans, that will eventually bear fruit for a new top-down Zelda experience. I just wonder when it comes whether it will follow the multiplicative approach of Eiji Numa and Hidemaru Fujibashi or whether they can carve out a different role for 2D Zelda and channel some of the wonder approach piloted by Shiro Mori. Do let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks everyone for watching and I will see you next time for another Nintendo Forecast.